Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let's start the afternoon talks now. Uh, don't forget to put your name and institution on YouTube chat and uh, fill the presence form that will be available soon also in the chat. So, the next speaker is the researcher Jorge Tonfa, and I am the session chair. Uh, Jorge Tonfa is a postdoctoral researcher at the Space Research Institute of the Austrian Academy of Science. He works on plateau and smile missions of the European Space Agency, ESA. Uh, he received the Electronic Engineer degree for Pontifical Universidade Católica del Peru, uh, the Master and PhD degree in Microelectronics from URGS, Brazil. His research interests include soft error mitigation techniques and radiation effects on FPGAs. Thank you very much, Jorge, for, for accepting our invitation. Uh, the order is with you. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thank you, Alexandra, for the for the introduction and also for the invitation. I'm glad to be to be here to to present uh, a little bit of my work. So today's uh, presentation is about FPGA space applications. Um, my presentation I have organized it as follows. I will present uh, the institute where I work, that is the Space Research Institute. And uh, also I will talk a little bit what is the differences between electronic circuits for critical applications and uh, the electronics for normal commercial applications. Uh, I will talk uh, what, what is an FPGA, that is the device that uh, I use for uh, for these circuits in for, for these space applications. What are the soft errors that are one of the reliability issues that we have in, in these devices? And uh, I will present some FPGAs that are used for space applications and uh, two examples of space missions that uh, use these FPGAs and are the ones that I am involved in the Institute. Okay, so the Space Research Institute of Austria is located in Graz. That is the second largest city in Austria. Uh, it's an old city from before of the 14th century and is the capital of Styria, uh, of the Styrial state. Here in the slide, you can see two of the site scenes uh, or major uh, locations of the city, the clock tower, the Schlossberg clock tower and the Murinzel, uh, that is an island, in, that is a floating island in the middle of the Moor River, that is a river that cross the city. So some notable citizens of Graz includes uh, Kepler, Johannes Kepler, that is the one that defines these laws for uh, planetary motion, and also Nikola Tesla that studied also in Graz, that uh, he invented this alternating current system that is the one that we are using up to now. So the Institute uh, for Space Research uh, studied basically uh, space plasmas, planetary atmospheres, and exoplanets for almost 50 years. And today we are about 100, uh, between 100 scientists and engineers from 20 different nations. And we built uh, space qualified instruments and analyze and interpret the data that comes from these instruments. So currently we are involved in around 22 active and future space missions. And I would like to show some of them. Uh, for example, we have the Bepi Colombo mission. Uh, that is a mission to study Mercury that was launched in 2018. We have the Keops mission that is an exoplanet uh, space telescope that was launched in 2019. 
we have the cluster mission that uh, that its objective is to study the earth uh, the interaction between sun and earth magnetosphere solar orbiter that is a mission for to study the sun especially the polar regions of the of the sun that uh, this mission was launched in 2020 last year and we have also MMS that is similar as a similar mission as cluster that is studying the earth magnetosphere this mission for example is a cooperation uh, with NASA uh, most of of the missions uh, are uh, missions that are uh, from the European Space Agency but we also cooperate or participate in missions from other agencies so and um, uh, future space missions we can include a uh, plato that is the one that i'm involved that is also a space telescope uh, to study exoplanets uh, in particular terrestrial exoplanets we have the smile mission that also is a mission to study the interaction between sun and an earth magnetosphere we have Athena that is also an, a space telescope, but most focused on the X-ray X-ray band. Uh, it will study the hot hot gases structures of the universe and supermassive black holes. The most recent uh, approved mission is this comet interceptor, that is a mission to study an object an object that will uh, that comes from outside of our solar system so it's a very very new idea where we are going to send this spacecraft to a special point in in, in between the orbit of uh, the sun and the earth that is the lagrange point 2 and there this satellite will wait for uh, the opportunity to 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 study one of these uh, interstellar objects and uh, yeah, so this is one of the latest uh, approved missions. And um, finally, we have JUICE, that is a mission that should be launched next year, that will study Jupiter and three of the uh, largest moons, Ganymede, Callisto, and Europa. So in the Institute, we are um, basically organized in four big uh, research groups. We have the space plasma physics group where they study basically the processes between the, the heliosphere, including this uh, interaction between the magnetosphere of the Earth or other planets with the solar wind. We have the exoplanet uh, group uh, where they concentrate on observe and characterize these exoplanets that are these planets that are outside of our solar system and we have also this satellite laser raging group that is a technique that is used to measure the distance between uh, between satellites or space debris uh, using a very short laser pulses and finally we have the flight instruments group that uh, focuses on development of the uh, board computers and magnetometers that will go in these uh, space uh, satellite missions, and this is a work where where I uh, where I belong. So uh, in this um, flight instruments group, we have a, a different set of challenges, like the instruments that we built should be able to to operate in extreme temperatures in high energy radiation environment. So it should also survive to the stress of the launch and one uh, and also no repair is possible. So that means that uh, these systems should work at the in, in the first uh, at the first try. So for for developing these types of instruments, we have uh, some special test equipment like uh, test uh, temperature test facilities. We have also uh, vacuum chambers to 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 test our our instruments we have a laboratory specialized for magnetometer characterization and we have a clean room uh, where we mount and uh, develop this flight uh, the flight instruments that are going to be on on these satellites so usually for the development of these instruments uh, we have a set of stages usually we we start with a prototype model 
and then we produce an engineering model that is a more complex uh, version of the of the instrument then we have the qualification model and uh, that we are going to use for the qualification test campaign and finally we produce the fine uh, the flight models that are the actual hardware that goes into the, the satellites so in the onboard uh, data processing unit our main task is to develop hardware and software for these flight instruments and we have two main research topics. The first one is instrument development. As for example, for the mission Bepi Colombo, uh, we have participated developing two instruments, the ION Camera PCAM and the ASPOC NG uh, instrument that is an active spacecraft potential control uh, instrument. We have the digital processing a research topic that includes developing of these DPUs that are these data processing units that uh, we have developed uh, DPUs for missions as Solar Orbiter, we're going to develop for Athena and Common Interceptor also. We have also the development of DPU eBox that is a complete uh, a system that uh, includes not only the DPU but also on the power system unit or other specialized units and examples of these are uh, the developments for the Kiops mission and for the SMILE mission. So and a third uh, different type of unit is the one that we are developing for Plato that is a router and data compression unit. So the electronics for uh, critical applications uh, have a, a characteristic that this can, these circuits cannot, cannot fail. What happens if there is a failure in one of these systems where, for example, in a case of an airplane or a train, we can have human deaths or, or severely damaged people. We can have also lost of highly uh, cost equipment like for example the satellites or environmental damage acts, for example in a nuclear reactor so all uh, a main characteristic of all these circuits is that they require a high reliability to avoid failures and this is what we what we have in mind when we develop this this uh, these circuits so in my case i will focus now on fpgas and i will explain how uh, how uh, how this device works and uh, how these devices are used in space applications. So these FPGAs are uh, integrated circuits that you can uh, configure after the chip was manufactured. So uh, you have the flexibility to implement different types of circuits. And nowadays these FPGAs have uh, the, they have a high logic density where you can integrate different types of tasks and functions up to the point that you can build uh, complete system on chips. Uh, usually this uh, you will find three types of FPGA that are classified depending on how is the configuration memory of the device. So we can have SRAM based, flash based or anti-fused uh, based FPGAs. So the SRAM based is a volatile, use a volatile memory and SRAM memory. The flash and anti-fuse, they are non-volatiles and they use non-volatile memories. And the main differences is that the anti-fuse cannot be reprogrammed. The flash based can be can be reprogrammed. So the typical architecture of an FPGA is uh, a set of blocks. You have these uh, generic blocks of logic, generic blocks of memory, and also some DSP blocks like multipliers, others that are all interconnected by a programmable matrix and you can uh, really define the configuration of the input outputs and how these blocks are going to operate and how these blocks are interconnected so that's that's how you can generate almost any type of digital circuit and i will explain what is a soft error that is uh, one of the main uh, reliability issues on, on, on these devices. So these soft errors are uh, undecided state changes in, in the electronic devices like, like transistors in these FPGAs. 
that are caused because of uh, ionized particles. So uh, this means ionizing radiation. So usually these, these soft errors do not, uh, will not harm the device. That's why they are called soft. Uh, and usually uh, so they will only alter the, the data or signal uh, in the circuit, but not, not the device. So how this, this alteration is produced? So here you have an example of a particle hitting the device. And the energy of this particle can be collected by, by this device. And this, this energy charge collected will produce different types of events. So we, uh, you can have uh, one type of effect could be that, for example, the state of a flip-flop or an strong memory is uh, inverted. So you're going to have a bit flip, for example. So from where uh, come these uh, ionized particles? So basically, for, for missions, uh, for the satellites that we build, this radiation comes from the sun. So normally, the sun is producing, uh, ejecting these particles that, uh, that we call the solar wind. But also, we can find some special type of high energetic events like solar flares or, or coronal mass ejections. And these, these type of events are uh, are mainly composed by protons, electrons, and in a less proportion by heavy ions. So all these particles can affect our, our devices. Uh, we have another source of, of particles that are the galactic cosmic rays, but these have less density, but uh, high, but can, can have uh, more high energetic uh, particles. So these particles are also mainly protons and in a small proportion, heavy ions. And a, and a special region of interest for some of our missions are the Van Allen belts, because these are regions around the Earth that where we have these trapped particles. So it's a high, a high radiation region where usually we have protons and electrons. And this is from particular interest for missions that are going to be operating around these, uh, these radiation belts. So uh, the FPGA applications, we have uh, uh, what are the characteristics of these uh, FPGA uh, devices that are used in, in radiation hardened uh, uh, systems or, or circuits. So what means to be a radiation hardened? For example, we can say that uh, in some of these radiation hardened FPGAs, we have a triple modular redundancy of the flip-flops. So all the internal flip-flops of the device are triplicated and you have this voting system that you can see here. And this technique is used to to mask the, the fault effect of these uh, uh, soft errors, for example. Another type of uh, protection is to use uh, error correction codes, or ECCs, to protect the user memories inside of this FPGA. So with this, also, we can protect the data that we are, uh, that we are um, putting on into these uh, user memories. And another type of feature is this scrubbing uh, feature that is used for correct the memory errors in the configuration memory of the FPGA. And this scrubbing technique is basically used to, uh, to avoid the accumulation of, um, of bit flips or soft errors in the configuration memory. Because in this configuration memory, we actually do not use all the all the bits in the configuration memory, but an accumulation of these uh, bit flips in the configuration memory can be a really a big problem. So uh, most of the so usually these FPGAs will have uh, the possibility to make the the scrubbing or correction of this of this memory. Another topic to to mention is the uh, single event latch-ups. That is another type of effect of the 
of these ionized particles hitting your device. And this is from uh, uh, for, of particular interest because this type of event can really damage the device. So uh, what this FPGA for space applications uh, provides is a characterization against this single event that chap to, to be sure that the device uh, will be able to operate correctly and the probability of this event is uh, if minimal. Also, another uh, another effect of the radiation on the device is what, what is called a total ionization dose, or TID. And this, uh, this effect, what, what will generate is a change on the characteristics uh, of the device, for example, on, on the timing or delays of the internal blocks of the FPGA will be altered. And we need to know how how much will be this uh, this alteration in the in the for example in the timing characteristics of the device. So usually these devices provide this characterization. And for example, when we uh, need to develop a, a design for a specific mission where we have a, a maximum amount of uh, ra radiation or TID. Uh, specification, we can use these values to simulate what is going to be the effect of the TID in the operation of, of our circuit. So with that, we can be sure that even in the, in the case that we are going to have this effect, the circuit will continue, will continue working. And uh, also, uh, we can mention that these uh, these devices usually will have a special layout or manufacturing process to reduce the susceptibility to to radiation effects uh, this includes for example having the, the layout of the transistors have a special layout or we are using or they are using some a different type of uh, process to produce the chip and all this all this is in order to to reduce the susceptibility uh, to, to these radiation effects. Also, uh, and finally, um, main differences between uh, these devices and the devices that are used for commercial applications is that uh, these devices are extensively tested and we have uh, a high traceability of uh, the production of these devices. So for example, we know which is the lot or uh, from, uh, from which lot the device that we are using uh, comes from, for example. And the test also is really extensive. To, so each device is tested and it's not only an, a statistical sample of the, of the production that is tested, but it's all the devices really that are tested. So that why, that's why also that the price of these devices is higher than in comparison to the commercial, commercial ones. So I will explain a little bit uh, for example, the case of these uh, TMR flip-flops, and I will explain with the example of the RTAX FPGA, that is uh, uh, one of the FPGAs that we are using in the Plato, the Plato mission. We have here uh, how, how this technique works in, uh, in, in the device. So let's imagine that we have just a single D-type flip-flop here that has a zero bit stored and what happens if uh, one particle hits uh, this device let's see ah, oops i need to okay so if a particle hits this device uh, what we probably we are going to have if the uh, collected charge is enough to to invert the the state of the flip-flop we are going to have a different value. We are going to go from a zero to one. And the main problem of these events is that we don't know when when and where these events are going to happen. So these are just random random events that uh, that can alter the the content of your or the value of your flip-flop. This is in a sim uh, in a normal uh, D type flip-flop. But in the in the triplicated version of this flip flop, we have in the feedback loop we have these boaters that allow that allow us to uh, to mask the effect of this 
of this problem. So what happens if we have also the same uh, particle hitting the device? Uh, we will not have the inversion of the of the stored bit because uh, this triplication and the voting system will allow that in the next clock cycle of the of the of this flip flop, uh, we are going to be able to to correct or to mask the fault uh, that was generated by this particle. So this is what is called uh, a fault masking that. Uh, we cannot prevent that this uh, event will happen, the single event upset, but we can mask the 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 effect that will uh, that that will be produced. And uh, yeah, that's one of the fault masking is one of the uh, main techniques that that are used in these devices. So the second type of technique is uh, is this scrubbing technique that is mainly used can be used for the user memory but uh, mainly it's used for the configuration memory and what it means is that uh, it will try to avoid the accumulation of uh, of uh, the single event upsets in the in the configuration memory because this accumulation can be really a problem it, it can really alter the 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 characteristics of the design that you, you want to implement in the FPGA. And this scrubbing technique is, is a fault correction technique where you can uh, eliminate these, these errors introduced in the memory. And for that, you have different techniques. You can use also error correction codes. You can have a golden reference of the configuration memory, for example, stored in a, in a prompt memory. And with this, we uh, we avoid having a, a, a reliability issue on, on these devices. So examples of uh, this type of devices, we have the RTAX that uh, is an anti-fuse uh, based FPGA. We have the RTG4 that uh, and pro 3 e RT versions that are flash-based uh, radiation uh, hardened FPGAs. Uh, we have the Vertex 4 QB and 5 QB that are from Silinx, that these are SRAM-based uh, FPGAs. And lately, we have this uh, NG Medium FPGA that uh, is, uh, is an SRAM-based uh, uh, FPGA, and we are going to use this device for the SMILE mission. So I will present uh, two examples of uh, of usage of these FPGAs in, in these space missions. But first, I would like to make an overview of the usage of these devices in, in space missions. This is a graphic uh, graph from the from some ESA missions, and they show the number of ASICs and FPGAs uh, used in, well, not so recent ESA, mission, ESA missions. You can see that these, these values are around of hundreds of devices between ASICs and FPGAs for different types of missions, some big missions like Rosetta in 2004, uh, or the Galileo satellites, or Bepi Colombo, you can see here, and uh, you can see that the number of FPGAs are around 250 devices, uh, FPGAs inside this, this satellite. So there is an extensive use of these devices in, 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 this, in these missions. So the, the first mission that I would like to explain is the Plato mission. This is an exoplanet hunter or uh, characterize, uh, exoplanet uh, characterization mission. So the main goal is to detect and characterize uh, terrestrial exoplanets. Uh, for this type of planets, there is a, a particular characteristic that usually these terrestrial planets are very small compared to the, to the host star. So that means that the quality of the uh, of the sensors of the optical sensors that you're using to 
to detect these uh, these transits, the transit of the planet in front of the of the star should be of a very high uh, precision. So these exoplanets are up to the habitable zone of solar type of stars because there are several types of stars, but in this mission they're focusing on solar type uh, uh, or stars that are similar to our sun and that should be in the range of the habitable zone. That, that means that they can have the characteristics or the or the uh, or the characteristics that uh, this planet can can have some type of life as as we know so the payload of this satellite is composed by 26 cameras that results in a many wide uh, field collined telescopes so that will give the telescope a huge uh, a huge so it will be able to to analyze a huge number of stars at, at the same time of our galaxy. And uh, in our case, we are in charge of the development of the router and data compressor unit that is called RDCU. So the launch for the scheduled launch for this mission is 2026, and this is an ESA mission. ESA mission. So our contribution to this uh, to this mission is this router and data compressor unit that is part of the instrument controller unit. So the instrument controller unit is the the unit in charge of uh, the the controlling of all these twenty six telescopes, and we have developed this uh, this unit in close cooperation with the University of Vienna. They have developed the compression algorithm and the VHDL implementation for the FPGA. And also with, uh, with the National Institute of Astrophysics in Italy that they are in charge of the production of this instrument control unit. So our unit is inside this, uh, this instrument controller unit. In our case, in this case, we're only developing uh, developing the uh, the hardware that uh, includes the uh, spacebar router, um, FPGA, and um, SRAM memory. There are the three main components. Uh, this block is a key element in the communication system of the of the Plato uh, satellite because it will it will communicate all these twenty six. Uh, telescopes with the main computer that is in the instrument controller unit. So the reliability and availability of this uh, design is uh, the main criteria. And to have a little bit of notion of how many data uh, will flow through this uh, through this unit, the, that expected data uh, volume for for this unit is around 435 gigabits per day. So this is the amount of data that will be collected from these telescopes and need to be compressed. So the current results of the compressor algorithm uh, is that we have a compression factor of around three. And this value is because we are using a, a looseless compression algorithm. So that is what is required to for the to to obtain the scientific goals. So here we can see um, the an schematic of the data processing unit or data processing system of of Plato. We can we can see here the twenty four uh, normal cameras uh, that are included in the satellite, and also we have two fast cameras. The twenty four cameras are uh, uh, mainly for the for the observation of the stars also it, it is worth to mention that this observation will be a long time observation so it means that the satellite will be pointing to the same uh, area in the space for around for more than one year i think it's around two years of observation so also we would like to to see uh, uh, or to detect planets that have an an orbit orbital periods similar to the Earth, so around one year, for example. No? So if we observe for two years, we can have around uh, 
at least two transitions of this planet uh, in front of the host star. So all these cameras are controlled by these uh, FEE uh, units that are the front electronic units. And these electronic units are connected to, to these uh, DPUs. So these, these DPUs are in charge of all the, the first stage of processing of the, of the images that comes from these uh, telescopes. And is, there is also a similar approach for the fast cameras. And all these blocks are interconnected using um, a communication protocol called a space wire. So that's why all these uh, DPUs are connected, are interconnected to the main uh, control unit that is uh, shown here through this space wire router that will uh, route all this data coming from the from the cameras and forward them to the to the main computer of the of the instrument so this this main computer is in charge of receiving this information and classifying it to to set which type of uh, of information or images are going to be compressed by the FPGA and which ones are going to be done in hardware so roughly 90% of the of the images that are coming from the cameras are going to be compressed by the FPGA and the rest is going to be done by by software so this decision was uh, was made mainly because of performance issues because the CPU that was that was going to use or that is going to be used in this mission is not capable of compressing all the huge amount of of data that that uh, the cameras are producing so that's why it was decided to okay we're going to have a hardware uh, specialized unit that will implement uh, the hardware compression algorithm and then all this information is compressed and packetized and this then this information is downlinked to earth so as you can see here it's around 435 gigabits per day the expected amount of data so inside of uh, F this FPGA, the main objective is to perform the data image compression. But for that, we also need to implement some other blocks, like for example, this space war core that is in charge to communicate with the space war router using the space war protocol. And on top of this protocol, we have another protocol to interchange data that is called AirMap. So these two blocks are uh, necessary to be able to receive the data that comes from the main computer and to, to be able to perform the or to receive commands from the main computer. So we are just uh, a slave for this uh, master main computer and we, we wait for commands like uh, receiving data or start compression, stop compression or check for housekeeping information, etc. So uh, we we have developed these these two blocks uh, for for this for this mission. We have a wishbone internal bus that is a very simple uh, bus implementation to be able to communicate the internal blocks. We have the data compressor unit, and we have also this memory controller unit that is in charge of the communication with this SRAM memory that is used by the compressor core to, to perform the, the compression. And we are also in charge of generating the clock and reset signals for the rest of the board. So we have the space war router that uh, it requires two different uh, clock frequencies and, and reset signals. So all these signals are generated from the FPGA to the space war router. And uh, okay, so the next uh, the next example of usage of this FP, of these FPGAs are the the Smile mission. That uh, this is um, a mission uh, between ESA and the Chinese Academy of Science CAST. And the main of the main goal is to build uh, uh, a satellite that is possible to 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 have a more complete understanding of this interaction between the sun and the and the earth magnetosphere 
And the main difference between these missions and, and other previous missions that are also focused on, on this interaction between the sand and the magnetosphere is that this mission uh, will allow to, to have a global view of the interaction. That's why the, this, uh, this satellite will have a very high elliptical orbit and uh, in its orbit, it will go through this uh, Van Allen radiation belt. So in the next slide, I will explain uh, why this is important that, uh, in, uh, that in the, or the, the planet orbit, we, this, this satellite will cross the, the Van Allen uh, radiation belts. So these satellites have two main payloads. Uh, these are imaging instruments. One is a wide field uh, soft X-ray imager, XXI and they have another auroral ultraviolet imager. So we are in charge of the development of the SXI uh, EVOX DPU and the magnetometer inside of this satellite. This, uh, this mission is it's expected to be launched in 2024. And uh, in this slide, we can see that the, the main task of the FPGA is to communicate between uh, this radiation shutter electronics and the power supply unit. So uh, what is this radiation shutter electronics? It's what, what, is what I had mentioned uh, before that uh, the sensor for the SXI instrument is uh, it's too much sensitive to, to be exposed to the, to the high radiation in this uh, Van Allen belt. So that's why uh, in this mission, when the satellite is going through this, uh, Van Allen belt, we have a radiation uh, radiation door that will be closed to to protect the sensor from the from the high radiation in this uh, from the trapped particles in the Van Allen belt, and it will be opened again uh, after crossing the the Van Allen radiation belt, and this crossing is at least. Uh, is uh, so in its orbit is it's on daily so every day we should be done this process of closing and opening again this this radiation door that will protect the the sensor of the SXI. We, so uh, we have implemented these communication protocols we have uh, we also need to collect the housekeeping information that includes for example temperature information of the board or different components we also collect the information of uh, the voltage power supplies. And uh, this FPGA also needs to generate uh, the clock and reset signals because uh, in this case, we are using an FPGA together with a processor. So the FPGA also is in charge to generate the clock signals and reset signals for the processor. And also is in charge to enable the processor to access uh, different types of memories that the processor was not uh, originally designed. So in this case, uh, we're enabling the processor the access to a PROM memory and an SRAM and an MRAM memory. And this is implemented inside of this FPGA. And the main challenge that we have for, for this mission is that it's the first time that we're going to use this uh, NG medium SRAM based FPGA, and uh, so we we are now in the stage that we are uh, uh, adapting our our design flow to to this new device and to be familiar with the with the tool and so to to be able to set up a complete flow from the from the design input on BHDL uh, level up to the the post place and route. Uh, net list of, of the device. So these are currently our main uh, uh, tasks inside, uh, inside the Institute. And so with that, I would like to conclude my presentation. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your attention. And if you have some questions, uh, yes, I, I am uh, here to answer if, if, it, if I can. So thank you very much, Georgi, for the fantastic presentation. Now it's time for questions. Uh, guys, do you see if you do have uh, any questions, please put in the chat. 
Uh, I have some questions. Uh, the first yes. is a curiosity. Uh, what are the main uh, steps involved in space missions? And how long until uh, the mission is completed? Ah, okay, yeah. Uh, so the, the first part of your question was, uh, which are the main stages? So, uh, steps. The steps. main steps involved in space missions. Okay, so usually these, these missions, uh, they start with a scientific objective. So the, the this scientific objective is defined and based on these objectives is uh, proposed uh, how this the satellite or how many instruments will this satellite uh, include and which are the specifications for each of the instruments inside the, the satellite. So this is a process that can take ma many years up to the final specification of the mission. And also this needs to be approved by the, by the, uh, by the space agency. And so after only after this, uh, uh, all this mission is approved is, is the point where the, the satellite is started to be, to be implemented or to develop. And as I have mentioned in some of our slides, we have more than less um, a predefined uh, development flow where we have different types of models to, to, to implement the, our instruments. And in each stage, we have a specific objectives like testing the functionality or testing that the uh, electrical uh, characteristics of the of the circuit are are correct and then in the final stages we are going to test for all these temperature changes str or mechanical stress or uh, vacuum or testing the 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 instrument in a vacuum chamber to to see if it's able to dissipate correctly the 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 heat that will produce or different types of tests until we produce this final uh, flight uh, flight models that are really the ones that are going to be included in the in the in the satellite mm -hmm. okay thank you george i have another question uh, currently i work with mitigation techniques at the circuit level for synthetic uh, in your research group uh, do you have any space ASIC design using FinFET technology or not? If not, uh, do you have any plans for this in the near future? Yes. Uh, okay. So uh, related to that question, in the flight instruments group, we have two subgroups. One is the one where I work, that is the onboard computers, and the other is the magnetometer. In the onboard computers, we are usually using uh, radiation hardened FPGAs, but I know that in the magnetometer team, they have also developed some ASICs uh, for for controlling uh, these magnetometers. And at least I know that they have one ASIC uh, that was already uh, produced, uh, tested, and it's in orbit. And I think they are already in the second version of this ASIC uh, development, but I don't, I'm not sure about the details of, for example, if they are going to use a FinFET uh, process technology or what techniques are they are using to protect uh, against radiation effects. So that's not so, I am, I'm not sure about these, these details. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have a, cash, a question from audience. Uh, the question of Igor is, what is the PID and SEF expected for these missions? Okay, for, for, the, for the SER, that is the software rate expected. Uh, I don't have the, the 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 right values at least for example for plato or smile but in in terms of tid for example for plato the expected uh, tid uh, uh, those that 
uh, the mission was defined is around 50 kilorads. So usually these FPGAs are designed for up to 200 kilorads. So in this case, uh, uh, the FPGA that we are using, that is the RTAX, is suitable for using in this mission. Yes. Guys, more questions? No. Okay, okay, Georgie, thank you again. Thank you, thank you. Thank you and yeah. the organization for this nice workshop. Yes. Ah, uh, there is oh. uh, other question. Okay. <laughs> Uh, do you use Omer and fast ah. fast spreading your group? <laughs> yes, this, this is a this is a good question from from Igor. Actually, in the last uh, the last months, we were trained uh, to use Omer tool, the Omer tool for the for obtaining so for, for trying to obtain expecting uh, software or rates, uh, but uh, still this. Uh, this process is, is ongoing. So, but yes, at least the Omer tool we, we we have we have used. Okay, we have one more questions from Anderson. Uh, what is the most challenging part in the FPGA project? Uh, okay, in in this case of of these projects. Uh, maybe the the most challenging is that we we need to have a very high uh, reliable design so for that at least in our design process we have an extensive uh, verification campaigns to really uh, test all the possible scenarios that uh, the design will going to be uh, will going to be used so uh, and we not do not only do a uh, functional verification campaigns. So we also, for example, we use the post place uh, timing timing netlist models to to run again all of our uh, test cases campaigns. So with that and these post place uh, timing models, we we generate this with the information of the manufacturers about the how it's going to be the changes in the delay uh, due to the radiation due to the TID TID accumulation so we can set which is going to be the maximum expected TID uh, accumulation and the tool will generate us a model a timing model of of our design and we use these timing models to uh, to to run again all of our uh, verification campaigns in order to be sure that uh, the design will be operating after these effects are on the FPGA. So thank you very much again, Georgie. See you. Later. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye.